Hello, hello, welcome to our webinar on high functioning Asperger's children. Um, my name is William, and for those who have been to our Sunrise Program startup, our uh, advanced trainings, welcome. Good to uh, have you here with us yet again. I hope your programs are going good, you're enjoying yourself, and you're, you're seeing the changes in your children that you want to be seeing. Now, for those, this is your first time here uh, visiting and seeing us, uh, welcome. Let me just introduce myself a little bit, give you a, uh, an idea of who I am and uh, why I'm talking to you. I am, I'm William, I'm a senior teacher, senior trainer here at the Autism Treatment Center of, of America. I've been working here for over 18 years with families, with children on the spectrum of autism from uh, severe autism all the way up to high functioning Asperger's children and it's been the most amazing experience to work with with all the children with all the families that I have worked with. I'm also a Sunrise program father having run a program with my daughter Jade who had autism and me and my wife, we ran a, a program with her for a number of years, and she's fully recovered, is uh, no longer autistic. She's in school, she's doing magnificently, she's doing wonderfully. So as I talk, to you, talk with you here today, I'm talking from not only a teacher, from being a teacher who, who has learned a lot from my experiences, but also from a point of view from a father who has known the 24-hour experience of, of having a child with the autism and with the challenges and the beauty that comes with that. So uh, welcome all of you as we talk about this specific topic which I know you're excited about which is high-functioning Asperger's children, how to help them become more socially able, more socially capable in their lives, whether it's with mom and dad, whether with their peers, whether in school, whether with siblings, because helping them be more socially capable will not only help them, obviously, within their relationships, but it will also help them in handling all the challenges, all the dynamics of the world in a more capable and a, and a more uh, more of a way that will be more beneficial for them and also the people around them. Now, when I talk about Asperger's or high functioning children, I'm talking about children who are highly verbal, they're considered highly verbal, they speak in sentences, in paragraphs, you can have conversations backwards and forwards. Yes, maybe about a certain, just one particular topic, but you can have that with them. That they may be academically doing great in school, might even be ahead of uh, their age level, so they are doing fine academically. There are also uh, children who can demonstrate and show an understanding of the world around them to the degree that they do it. And so what, what we're going to do is be talking about these children. Now, one of the things that tends to come up with these types of children, and I say children, and I mean children whether they're 8 years old, 16 years old, 25 years old, because they're somebody's child. And so as I talk about them, I'm talking about your particular child, whether your child is older, teenager, or younger. Uh, the thing is, as people look at your children, that they, if they were to take a snapshot, they see, wow, they seem very capable. They seem very uh, able to handle certain situations. They're doing great at school. Yet, the type of autism that your child has can be easily um, overlooked, easily not seen. Um, because because they are so capable in other areas. And people then expect them to be able to be fully functioning, fully capable, when in fact they're not. They still have this challenge. They have a specific challenge. There's something, um, you could say, awry in their neurology that makes it difficult for them to socialize. To the degree that maybe you or I socialize, or their neurotypical uh, sibling socializes. Yet you see them when they come home, you know, maybe after school or the environment they were in, they might have a meltdown, they might cry, they might scream, they might shout. 
you see those types of things. You see, as you talk with them longer, they're actually perseverating on the topic that they're talking about. You see that. And you may even see, too, that for some of your children, because they have a challenge trying to understand and get what they want at certain times, they might even be moved to using physical ways to get what they want. Or you might see how they, after coming home from school or whatever the situation, how they go off and they isolate themselves, not connecting very strongly with you, mom and dad, or the other members of the family. And yet, what we're wanting to do is then really help them with this aspect of their abilities. They, yeah, they're doing great with all these other aspects, maybe academically, um, hygiene or whatever it might be. Yet when it comes to socializing and relating with other people, this would be their number one challenge. Being able to uh, have and sustain ongoing meaningful relationships with other people. Again, whether it's with you, mom and dad, with peers, siblings, teachers, anybody who they come into contact with, wanting them to be able to socialize and be flexible, be spontaneous, is key and fundamental, not only in social relationships, but handling other, all other aspects of what life will present to them. There was one, I remember one particular mother, she came to our intensive program. She had an 18-year-old son. He had Asperger's. And we had the, the greatest time working with him during he, his time here with us that week. And she shared a time when, about when he was seven, eight years old, how the kids in the neighborhood, he wasn't making friends with them. And so she would invite them over. She would get cake. She would get fizzy drinks. And she would invite them over, thinking that that would help him. And so there's all these children around. And he's in there, and there, there's some talking back and forth. But when it came to the time when all the cake was gone and the kids went out into the, the garden or back into the neighborhood to play with one another, he was still left standing with her because he lacked that ability, that social, as I say, stickiness to be able to create relationships and sustain relationships with other children, with his peer group. And as we worked with him at 18 years old, we worked with him... We worked with him at the level he was at, and now, as I've spoken to his mother, he, uh, he has friends. He has friends he goes on vacation with. He has a girlfriend. His relationship with his mom and dad and his sister has never been stronger, and he has a job, and he is just doing magnificently. And so, there, no matter where your child is, there's something you can do to help them right here, right now, to help them take the next step forward in their social ability. So the three strategies I'm going to talk to you about starts with really their repetitious behaviors, whether it's verbal or whether it is manipulating objects or doing activities, is really about starting where your child is. And it's starting with, number one, with how do you feel about it? Is your attitude towards your child's behavior? All right. Now, this behavior could be absolutely anything. It could be, I mean, we have, we've, uh, and I've worked with children who will talk about garbage trucks over and over and over again. Or the London Underground, talk about that over and over and over again. The, I've worked with children who will keep asking the same question again and again. Who do you think is going to come next? Who do you think is going to come next? As he was asking the question about who's going to come in and play with him next. But he kept answer, asking the question over and over and over again. Even though I told him a thousand times, he was still asking the question. All right. So no matter what your childhood, I, we've had uh, I worked with a 15-year-old a, a child who would just write over and over on grains of rice. He would write names. Just on, and that was the thing he did over and over and over again. There was one particular child, 13-year-old, he was into watching soap operas, and he watched this one. He loved it. He watched it again and again and again. He went to his computer. He went to the website, downloaded a picture of all the cast, and he put them up. And then that became his fantasy world that he played within in a very solitary way. 
And so, you now this child with again was considered high functioning Asperger's. And so, it can be any activity, any activity that your child is doing. Now, the now typically what tends to happen is as people view these types of behaviors, is there's there's a sense of judgment, a sense of frustration towards these behaviors. In part, part of it can come from seeing that hey, my child is so capable. Uh, I almost get, I forget that they have this challenge, that they have this neurological challenge. And so we expect, there's an expectation that, boy, they should not be doing this. They should be moved on. This should be real easy to get over. Yet, if it was as easy as that, I suppose we wouldn't be talking right now. It definitely is more of a challenge that requires more energy, more effort, and a particular type of approach to help your child move beyond these repetitious behaviors. And so our attitude is important. I have a quote here from a mother who she wrote, she has a high functioning autistic uh, daughter and she wrote this and, this. and she was very honest about her attitude, which, which I loved. She says, and this is what she says about her daughter, she seems so capable sometimes and I often forget that some things are very difficult for her. I feel annoyed and then I feel guilty for letting myself be annoyed by her. And so maybe that's something you have that when you think about your child's particular challenges. Take a moment right now, just take a moment and just think. When you think about that behavior that your child's doing again and again, how do you feel about it? Do you feel annoyed? Do you feel frustrated? Is there a sense of fear? Fear of the future, what does this mean? Like, what's the feeling that comes up within you? And be aware of it. And because it will definitely have an impact on your child. And so the first place is really saying to yourself, okay, I'm, I'm aware of having this feeling. And I'm going to give you a few ideas of maybe helping you feel more easy, more relaxed. Um, and in our programs and in our material, there's a big part we put towards helping families feel more easy, more relaxed when approached with the challenge of their child's repetitious, their ismy behavior. So be aware of that. Now, something that you can do, something you can think about that might help you is having an understanding. Seeing that your child, because your child is doing this repetitious, which is not neurotypical in its behavior, which really says that they ha their neurology, the way, the way that their brain is wired, isn't the same as their neurotypical brother or sister or their peer group or maybe you. And that they have a challenge. And so they're doing it for whatever the reason might be. It could be this. They don't process the world like you or I. They're easily overwhelmed by the stimulus whether it's visual, whether it's hearing, through smell, taste, they can be overstimulated by this. And then what's happening is they have a difficult time trying to comprehend and understand human interaction, which can be a very complex, forever changing uh, uh, thing in their lives. And so they got to put this all together. And they can, be, they can be easily overwhelmed. They might look like they're doing good, but really what they're doing is surviving versus thriving. And what you're wanting to do is help them actually thrive versus survive. And so you want to shift to having understanding. Now I've answered a question where a child, as I said earlier, was saying, who's coming next? Who's coming next? I give them the answer. It's Linda. It's Linda. It's Linda. Every time they ask that question of me, and I'm answering the question with fun, with ease and delight, because what I'm thinking to myself, it's not about the question. It's not about the answer. What they're seeking is a sense of predictableness, a sense of control a sense of sameness in their lives because everything else is a bit more chaotic and not controllable. So this question and getting this answer, oh, that's the sameness, that's the predictableness that will help them feel centered, feel calm and feel relaxed. Look, if you've had an overwhelming day, think about it. When you've had an overwhelming day, it's been overstimulating. There's a lot been happening. Don't you just want to come home and sit down? Maybe some of you just sit down and go, oh, maybe you get a glass of wine. Maybe you sit and read a book. 
Maybe you listen to your favorite piece of music. You do something to ah, oh, just find a sense of calm, a sense of centeredness. Our children who have bigger challenges are doing this on a moment-to-moment-to-moment -to -moment -to -moment basis. So really understanding that they're doing the best they can and this is the way that they take care of themselves. You can rest assured that they don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to be a pain in the butt for mom and dad. I'm going to ask that question over and over and over and over and over again. I don't think they're doing that. They're doing this because they are having a challenge. So when you see them asking those questions again and again or doing activity again and again, you can look at them and say, they have challenges. They're actually trying to find a centered, calm place inside of themselves. Good for them. They're doing the best they can. And so you can have a sense of understanding, a sense of acceptance, a sense of compassion towards how they're looking after themselves. You could also think too, which is this, and I've seen this with children, they'll come up and they'll ask you the same question over and over and over again, or they'll talk about the same topic, garbage trucks, or the London Underground, over and over and over again, because they want to interact, but they don't know how. And the only thing they know is garbage trucks, so they do the same topic over and over and over again, because they don't have the ability or the understanding right then and there to take it further for themselves. And so part of it is also saying, oh wow, my child doesn't know how to go beyond this, doesn't know that, okay, there's other ways to communicate. So what you're wanting to do is have a sense of acceptance, to say it's okay what they're doing. You even want to go one step further. Not only do you want to say it's okay, you want to enjoy yourself. You want to enjoy yourself as you're interacting with your child as they're doing this, saying, oh, wow, this is so much fun. I'm interacting with my child. Because your enjoyment, your sense of acceptance and your enjoyment will give them the added thing in their environment, which is, oh, wow, ah, even mom and dad, they're enjoying this. So everything's okay. Things are, are controllable. Things are com predictable. Because you do know. I'm sure you do know, when you get frustrated, you get annoyed, you get tight, then it makes your child get tight, and then it escalates into um, maybe friction, maybe child going off, maybe some other interaction going on, but it really doesn't help your child feel more relaxed and more easy. So this strategy is a strategy, but I think it's a way of life in being with your child when they have these challenges, because it will help you feel more relaxed. And it will also help your child feel more easy and more centered and then more ready to interact further in a, to a greater degree with you. All right, so this, this strategy number one or technique number one, which is those repetitious behaviors, under, feel an understanding towards them, love them, accept them. And then we go to, to the second strategy is how can we help our children go further? How can we help them expand this repetitious behavior? How can we help them be more flexible, more spontaneous, as they interact in this uh, repetitious, um, isn't-me sort of way with you? All right, so the first thing to do is understand, there you are. You're loving it as your child talks about garbage trucks, or you're loving it as they talk about Legos or Barbie dolls, or you're loving it as they talk about um, whatever it might be, You're just or the activity. You're just loving it and enjoying it. So you're in the bubble of their world as a fellow enthusiast, enjoying this activity as best you can. So as you're doing that, then you're looking for a timing, a space, when you can actually come out and say and, and ask your child to take a step outside of what they're doing, to expand on the activity that you're doing. So you're looking for timing. Now timing is this. Could be could be this. Initially your child's very controlling, very uh, repetitious, very rigid talking about the London Underground or garbage trucks or who's coming next or playing with that the rice over and over. It's very controlling and there really is no space to put in anything other than just to be there enjoying what you're doing. 
Now as your child feels your acceptance and as when they're ready, maybe there's a, a pause or a natural space within the interaction. Maybe as your child's talking about garbage trucks, they're talking about garbage trucks and they're talking their voices very fast and they're just wanting you to listen and you're excitedly listening to them as a way to say, hey, I'm here. And then what happens is there starts to be a pause and, a, and maybe a back and forth as you talk about garbage trucks. Then that's the opportunity when there's a space, a natural pause, a natural breathing space for you to come in and invite them to expand. Now I'm going to talk about what you can do exactly in a minute, but you're looking for these, these, these places of timing, all right, of where you can expand that. Maybe they ask you a question, and maybe as you answer them, you can add an expansion onto your question. You can add something in there. That might be another place where you can do it. So now let me tell, talk to you a little bit about how to expand. All right, I'm going to use some examples. Let's use an example of the boy who is riding on the rice. So there he is. He's riding on the rice. So there I am, doing my best to ride on the rice. And I have a piece of rice. And it, I can tell you, it's quite difficult. But if you persist, you can do it. So here he is. And there I am. I'm riding on the rice. And he would just write people's names who he knew on the rice. So I'm writing people's names I know on the rice. And as, we're, as I'm riding... I'm in the game, I'm in the bubble of his world, I'm enjoying myself, I'm feeling relaxed, I know my attitude is helping him feel there's a predictableness and there's an acceptance in the world for him. And then what happens is, he's writing a name and then I write a name, and there's that natural pause, that space, and I, and I say, oh, I'm, I'm writing Becky on mine. Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write uh, something I think about Becky, so I can put on this piece of rice. I'm going to write, here, look, I wrote loving. Yeah, yeah, hey, yes. Yeah, Becky, I find Becky to be loving. And I'm going to put that with her rice because I'm going to give that to her later on and she, I, I know she's going to enjoy it. Do you, now, do you know why I said she was loving? Well, she's loving because she is, when I see her, she always gives me a hug. She always very kind and says nice words to me. If I need help, she comes across and says, hey, can I help you? And so that's what, that's what she is to me. Oh, I see you just wrote Dad on that one. Now, what could you write about Dad? What's one thing you could write about Dad? Now, he sat there and he thought for a moment about it. He says, and then he write, um, he put plays. He put, and I said, oh, wow, he plays. Okay, well, what kind of stuff does he do, do with you? Well, he comes sometimes and he plays rice with me. He also, too, will throw a ball with me. And he does other activities with me. So that when I think of him, I think of, of a person who plays with me. So you can see where we built this interaction was in the rice. And for a moment in time, he starts thinking and expanding beyond his current activity and adding in a dimension. He's being flexible. And while we're doing this, we're interacting. Now, let me tell you another example. There was a, we had this little, little guy, well he's not a little guy, he was, he was about eight years old. And he loved this little cuddly toy, it was a snowman. And when he, when he was in our intensive program, he's in his playroom, he built a little house for his snowman. And it, we have a slide, and in the, within the slide you can open the door, and there's a little hole underneath. And in there he put a pillow, he put a blanket in there, um, he put a bottle of water in there, he put, put a few crackers in there for him. And so he built this whole, little home for him. And so he's telling, telling me about this home. And as he's talking to me, and, he's, and he keeps telling me about the home, and he's telling me things he'd already told me before. And there I am. I'm, I'm just loving and accepting him, having the best time as he's telling me about this snowman and his home. And then there comes a space in, in the, as he's telling me. And I said, that is the best home. Do you know what I think Snowman will like? There's something that's missing that I think will help him. Especially if you come to visit him, or if I come to visit him, or hey, if Elmo comes to visit him, he's going to need this. I, he's going to need a doorbell on that door so that his home, so if he's in there and he's asleep, and then he, if the doorbell goes, he'll wake up and he'll be able to come and answer the door. This is so exciting. Let's put a doorbell on there. 
And he sits there and he thinks about it and he goes, okay, yeah, he needs a doorbell. And he gets really excited. And so we put a doorbell on his house. So here he was, he was talking about his house initially, and he was caught up in just, he's got a blanket in, he's got a pillow, and he's got a drink and the crackers if he needs it. And he kept on talking within that one loop of conversation. And then when there was a space, I was excited and presented an, an addition, an expansion to his world. We actually went on. He had a doorbell in that house. We also built a garden with bricks around it. We actually sat down and we drew flowers that we could put in this garden. Then he came over and helped me uh, build my house for Elmo. And we interacted and we built an incredible world together. But we were together and he was practicing being social, being spontaneous, being flexible. But it all grew out of step-by-step -step variation to what he's doing. So we're not talking about changing the activity. We're talking about expanding the activity. Expanding the activity comes from you enjoying it and then you putting in a variation. And one of the keys here is actually as you present something, you are presenting it with excitement. Yes, the doorbell. Oh my gosh. Or Becky loving. Wow, she's going to just so love this. You're going to be excited about it versus, oh, you know, let's, let's, I think you might want a doorbell. If, you, if you're flat energy, you don't have any three E's, or very passionate, then your child's going to look at you and say, well, you're not very excited about it. Why, why would I want to do it? So you have to be passionate about it too. Now here's a little thing, a trap people fall into, particularly with high functioning, high verbal Asperger's children. They will, as a way to expand, do the, what we call the interrogation. They will ask them questions. So what are you doing? What's he doing? Where's he sleeping? What's he going to do here? And they're bombarding their child with questions because they think that's going to help the interaction. Asking a question isn't expanding the interaction. And what can happen is then our child can just shut off because they're just being either interrogated or tested to make sure they still have those same skills and they're still interacting. What you want to do is don't ask a question to begin with. Initially, what you want to do is say, what do I want to do? What's the expansion I want to put in here? Be really excited and present your idea with excitement, with fun, with delight as you do that your child's more likely to want to come along with you. Asking a question, asking the tenth question over and over again, isn't much fun. All right, so really what you're looking to do is enjoy yourself and expand, expand with, with what you have to offer. All right, now let's see if there's anything else. Just one other point on this, which is, as you do it, just know as you're playing, as you're interacting with your child, the interaction that your child is practicing how to be flexible. Even if they do say no to the game initially, they're still practicing interacting with you. They're seeing that you're controllable. They're seeing people predictable. They're seeing that people are enjoying their world. And if people are enjoying their world, then they're going to learn, hey, that's what you do. You can enjoy someone else's world. So we're actually modeling the very quality that we want them to establish in themselves. So this repetitious behaviors. Now, in terms of expanding it, also too, a quality you're going to want to help establish in your children is that quality of being able to interact in other people's activities. And this is the third strategy I'm going to talk to you about. Because when you break down human interaction, you could break it down into to two main areas. I know there might be some other areas, but two main areas are learning to include someone else within their activity and being flexible, spontaneous, and creative and interactive in their activity. Then there's also, oh, going to somebody else's activity and saying, boy, how can I interact within someone else's activity? How can I play with a peer within the game they want to play? can't always play what I want to play exactly the same way I want to play it. Peer relationship re requires reciprocity, a give and a take. So that ability to be able to play in another person's activity is important and essential. So what you're looking for here is timing again. You're looking for timing. 
You're looking for an opportunity and a time for when you can present the game, the activity that you want to present to your child. So the first thing is, um, the, the timing might be something like um, your child on a transition. When a new person comes in, you go and you come in with your activity. They're looking, they look up at you, you br and you can say, hi, hey. I've just come and I've got this great game that I want to play with you and here it is and then you present the game to them or you could be a time when they finish doing their repetitious behavior and they're looking like they're in between games they're looking like oh what am I going to do right now and so what you do there is you then say hey I have a game I want to present something to you look at this game and you present your game in a fun and exciting way. All right, so timing. You're also too going to prepare a little bit before you go in. Think of a game or an activity you would want to play with your child, and then as you as you think about that, think of maybe you could bring in a few props, um, some stuff that will actually help them um, get engaged and, and hold their interest. For example, I remember playing a game and doing an activity with Jade when she was at this level where I was trying to encourage her to play our games, our activities. I remember she was very into Legos. And so before I went in, I bought a $3 Lego car. All right? It was a little tractor. Um, and I broke all the pieces up, got all the pieces, and I had these plastic eggs, these old plastic eggs. And in each egg, I put a piece of Lego or a couple of pieces of Lego. Then what I did is I put a piece of tape on each of them. I came in, it, it came into the room, and I had it in a paper bag. And then Jade, seeing the paper bag, she said, what's in there? I said, I got a toy. I got a toy that we're going to play with. And so actually it's a wonderful game we're going to play. Um, do you want to play? And I, I showed her the eggs, and I said, oh, that's it. This, uh, no, no. You want to play? And she says, yeah, I'll play, I'll play. She, so she's really excited. So I said, oh, well, now I need to set it up a little bit. All right, so why don't you turn to the wall, all right, and we'll count together. So we counted. Well, I said, we've got to count to, I think, 40 would, would be enough. So then I stuck these eggs up on the ceiling, all right? Uh, and they were different color eggs, each with a different part of the, the, the Lego car in. And then she turns around, she sees the leg up, wow! And then I said, okay, now what we've got to do, we're going to work together as a team to get each of these pieces, each of these eggs down. Because look, see this picture? In each one of these Legos is a piece of this car. So in order to make it, we've got to get them all down. But we've got to do it a particular way. We've got to come up with different ways to get the eggs down. So we've got to talk about it and find out. And, and so she was really excited. And so for the first one I go, I said, well, well, I'll do the first one. First one is I can pick you up and you can get that first egg down. So I pick her up. She gets the egg. She brings it down and she brings it out and she puts out the leg. Okay, great. We got a, a, a certain part of it. Now she's so excited. She's motivated because she's into Legos. So when you think about creating a game, put a little bit of their motivation in there for them to want to be involved in the game. And so we went on in this game, in this activity, uh, for, uh, for an hour just working out different ways to get the different eggs down. And it was just a great game where we were talking backwards and forwards. We were thinking about different ideas. She would say an idea and I'd say, well, I'm not sure we can do that. There's sort of negotiations going on within it. And it was magnificent. And we just had the best time. She was looking and talking and just being so flexible and spontaneous, coming up with her ideas. And so that was a game I brought in with her. And you can do the same with your child. You can bring in a game, an activity. Now, if they say no to it, and there were times that Jade said no. She said, no, put it outside. So we're like, okay, it's going outside. And we knew, okay, we could bring it in tomorrow or the next day. And then we got down to just playing with her wherever she wanted to play her. Giving control is very important and very essential as you work with your child. You know your child is very sensitive about control, about predictableness, about having things done the same way. And so what you're going to want to do is if your child says no, you say, absolutely, you have control. No. And then you pick up from where they are. And if they say no a hundred times, you can say, excellent, 
okay. Because maybe they need to hear it a hundred times in order to feel, I have control. Because what they've heard a thousand times is, no, do what I want to do. 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 And so we really need to show them and reverse that message to say, the world's predictable, it's controllable, I'm predictable, I'm controllable. And so it might mean saying yes again and again and again um, to when they say no. You say, yes, absolutely, I'm going to put this away. Yes, absolutely, we don't have to play this right now. All right, so that would be bringing in a game and activity. And we talk extensively about um, these types of things, particularly within our advanced training programs, uh, New Frontiers, also to Maximum Impact, helping families with being creative, generating ideas, um, uh, having this attitude that will just help them create a deeper connection with their children. Now, a couple of other pointers I want to say before I'm going to go to answering questions, and I know that um, some of you have already sent in questions. Now, one of the things is this. This is particularly for those who haven't been to our startup program, which is you want to create a, um, a space. For those who've come to the startup program, I know you, um, I hope you have a, a focus room or a Sunrise Program Playroom where you can go in and just dedicate a certain amount of time working with your children. And I know I've seen some emails where some people have said, it was a challenge at first getting my child in there, but now loves it even though they're 14. So it, good for you. I'm excited that you, you're able to persist and to, to make that happen. But for those for the first time you're listening to this and you haven't been to our startup program, create a space in your uh, house, a quiet space where you can be with your child, where you're not going to be distracted, where you're going to have 30 minutes a day. Put aside the 30 minutes a day just to try out some of the stuff I have been talking about or the other material that you might have read or looked at on our website. So 30 minutes in a quiet room in the house would be ideal. You may do that every day. And I believe you're going to see some changes from that.